1983 World Series is brought to you by Miller High Life. The best beer for the best time of the day. Welcome to Miller Time. And by Chevrolet, official U.S. cars and trucks of the 14th Olympic Winter Games. Chevrolet and you taking charge. And by the Texas Instruments Home Computer, creating useful products and services for you. And by Delta Airlines, 35,000 professionals serving more than 90 cities in the U.S. and abroad. Delta is ready when you are. We had a rainy morning and a rainy afternoon, but a dry evening thus far in Baltimore. In fact, it's warmed up temperature in the 70s as we get set for game number two. Hello again, everyone. I'm Al Michaels. And of course, so much this year has been made of the Baltimore Orioles platoon system. But tonight, you'll see basically the same lineup. Only Dan Ford will be a switch. He'll replace uh, Dwyer in right field, and that's because they're facing a pitcher, a right-hander, as they did last night. Where you'll see the platooning is with the Philadelphia Phillies. It's interesting, and Gary Maddox touched on it during the pregame show. The Phillies were a veteran team. Tonight, only two fellas in the starting lineup are under the age of 30. But when Paul Owens replaced Pat Corrales on the 18th of July, when he came down from the front office, he knew that something had to be done. That something is platooning. Some of the players don't like to call it platooning. They euphemistically refer to it as playing the hot hand, and that's what they'll do tonight. In fact, in center field tonight will be Greg Gross, and right field will be Joe LaFay. And last night's hero, Gary Maddox, is back on the bench. Also, another thing to keep in mind as you watch the Phillies, could this be the last hurrah for some? There's some talk about Pete Rose, whether or not Philadelphia will pick up their option to retain Rose. Also, some speculation, he may end his career in Cincinnati. We don't know. Will Joe Morgan retire? Will Gary Maddox insist on a trade? Will Gary Matthews want out? Who knows? But it's a veteran team, and right now they're only three games away from a world championship as we get set for game two. I know one thing, Howard, when you talk about pressure tonight, it's on the Orioles because no team has ever lost the first two games of a series in their home park and come back to win. Well, Mike Schmidt certainly knows that. At lunch today, he said, now I believe it. We're a team of destiny. But I also agree with Reggie. Seven games is a long series, and the birds can't be written off yet. All right. Well... I talk about the birds of Baltimore. I want to talk again with our colleague Earl Weaver, who knows more about the birds than any man alive, quite probably. And item number one, why is Joe Altabelli, in your opinion, starting Dan Ford instead of Jim Dwyer when Jim had such a hot hand with the bat last night? Well, Joe, uh, Joe Altabelli has played Dan Ford a lot in right field. In fact, Joe did a lot less platooning in right field than he did in center field and he did in left field. Dan Ford has started 61 times against right-handed pitching uh, during the course of the season. Jimmy D Dwyer only started 36, and a lot of those were when Dan Ford was injured. Uh, Dan is a good ball player. He gives them extra speed. He gives them a little extra defense in the outfield. What the Orioles missed last night, I think, was a little production from the bottom of their order. And we talked about the designated hitter last night, how it, they're not allowed to use it during the 1983 World Series. And they definitely missed Kenny Singleton in the sixth spot. Now, about Vodica. This is a critical game. No question about it for the Birds. You expect him to excel as he did against the White Sox. Well, he certainly handled the White Sox, and last year he pitched seven times for the Baltimore Orioles in relief. He was in a pressure ball game during the uh, New York Yankees series. He won that particular ball game for us, and he showed an awful lot of heart in a Seattle ball game where he carried our ball club. He's a real good pitcher, Howard. Thank you very much, Earl. And now let's go down to Rex Bonney, the one-time Brooklyn Dodger great, and the public address system. Your attention, please. Ladies and gentlemen, it is time for me, the participants in the 1983 the manager of the Phillies, Paul Owens. Now the starting lineup. 
Leading off, the second baseman, number eight, Joe Morgan. Batting second, the first baseman, number 14, Pete Rose. Hitting third, the third baseman, number 20, Mike Schmidt. Batting fourth, the right fielder, number 23, Joe LaFay. Hitting fifth, the left fielder, number 34, Gary Matthews. Batting sixth, the center fielder, number 21, Greg Gross. Hitting seventh, the catcher, number six, Bo Diaz. Batting eight, the shortstop, number 11, Ivan DeJesus. In ninth position, now in the bullpen, warming up, the pitcher, number 49, Charles Hudson. And now here are the coaches and non-starting players from Philadelphia. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the American League champion, Baltimore Orioles. Here is the manager of the Orioles, Joe Altabelli. Now the starting lineup. Leading off, the center fielder, number one, Al Bumbry. Batting second, the right fielder, number 15, Dan Ford. Hitting third, the shortstop, number eight, Cal Ripken Jr. Batting fourth, the first baseman, number 33, Eddie Murray. Hitting fifth, the left fielder, number 38, John Lowenstein. Batting sixth, the second baseman, number 25, Rich Dower. Hitting seventh, the third baseman, number 10, Todd Cruz. The catcher, number 24, Rick Dempsey. In the ninth position, now in the bullpen, warming up, the pitcher, number 52, Mike Boddicker. And now, here are the coaches and non-starting players from Baltimore. with our national anthem, which tonight will be a repeat performance of sorts by the man who also sang the anthem this summer when Baltimore favorite Brooks Robinson was inducted into the Hall of Fame. Here is Baltimore's own Melvin Lowry.
Pre-game pageantry is over, and we're ready to watch two rookies go to the mound, Boddicker and Hudson, in game two of the 1983 World Series. On behalf of the American League, I'd like to introduce Tom Stout of Chevrolet, who presents the Championship Series Most Valuable Player Award to Mike Boddicker of the Baltimore Orioles. Mike Boddicker had a sensational rookie season, climaxed by a record tying 14 strikeouts in the second game of the American League playoffs, earning for himself selection as Chevrolet's most valuable player of the playoffs. Mike, it's a great privilege to present to you the keys to this new blazer for that accomplishment. Congratulations. Thank you, Mr. Stout. I'd like to thank you, the American League, and Chevrolet for this honor. The preceding message was furnished by Major League Baseball. Attention, please. Ladies and gentlemen, we direct your attention to the home plate side of the Baltimore dugout, where tonight's ceremonial first pitches will be thrown out by two men who helped lead the Orioles to world championships in 1966 and 1971. These men are now enshrined in baseball's Hall of Fame. They are accompanied by baseball commissioner Bowie Kuhn. Let's welcome Brooks Robinson and Frank Robinson. broadcast was, was applauding when Brooks and Frank threw out the first ceremonial balls. Frank, of course, the manager now of the San Francisco Giants, and Brooks, along with Chuck Thompson, broadcast the games of the Baltimore Orioles on television here. So Boddicker has just made his way into the dugout. The Orioles will be taking the field momentarily. And while we're waiting, many of you saw Boddicker pitch last week in the playoffs. A masterful performance, a shutout against the White Sox, and he is summed up by a man who should know, the three-time Cy Young winner, Jim Palmer. Well, he wouldn't have been here if I hadn't got hurt, Howard, so I guess I have to take a lot of credit, but um, with the exception of maybe two innings, he's had it almost been perfect the entire year. Um, he had an eight-run inning against Detroit, and then early in the year, he pitched a bad game against Kansas City, uh, gave up a three-run home, home run in one inning. Other than that, he, he's almost been picture perfect the entire year but basically he he does everything a good pitcher should do he throws strikes he can field his position he has a good fastball better than people give him credit for he's got excellent changeup, a good slider and he has the best curveball in the american league and when you couple all those things with an outstanding ball club you can see why he's been so successful and the orange takes the field the american league champions for 1983 winning the east by six and then in four games, they dispense with the Chicago White Sox in the playoffs. And defensively, the Gold Glove first baseman is Eddie Murray. And also the cleanup hitter at second base out of the University of Southern California. Played there under Rod Dato, Rich Dower, and right next to him, the shortstop and MVP candidate, Cal Ripken Jr. At third base, Todd Cruz, Leo Hernandez starting the season at third, and then Cruz picked up from Seattle in midseason. In the outfield tonight, it's the Steiner. John Lowenstein in left, who made the great catch last night to Rob Bo Diaz in the eighth inning. In center field, and there's no change there with the right-hander Hudson going. It's Al Bumbry. We'll take a look at John Shelby in game three facing Carlton. And there's Dan Ford in right field, who pinch hit last night. Bothered by foot and knee injuries, but in the lineup tonight on the wet grass with Rick Dempsey back of the plate for the Orioles. And Mike Boddicker on the mound. Boddicker in that shutout victory against the White Sox last week looked like he was about ready to come out in the eighth inning, but appeared to get a second wind in the ninth, went all the way, threw 142 pitches in that game, and he led the American League in shutouts this season with five. So he's thrown six in all, and for a man who started the season in the minors, that's quite a feat. Ed Vargo, a National League umpire, is back to the plate. Al Clark at first, Frank Pulley at second, Steve Palermo at third, and down the lines, 
Dutch Good runner in left, play. and Marty Springstead, who worked the plate last night in right. And Springstead must have done a pretty good job last night because there was nary a grumble. Not a word. I thought he umpired a tremendous ball game. And I wanted to say about Frank and Brooks Robinson, when you had those type of people on your ball club, you just sit back and relax and let them play ball and make things happen. So here we go with Joe Morgan to lead things off. Morgan, Rose, and Schmidt in the first inning. Game two with an off day tomorrow and then on to Veterans Stadium Friday as Morgan swings and misses. Joe, one for four, two for four last night with the home run in the sixth inning tying the game. He was second on the club to Schmidt in the regular season with 16 home runs. Change, and it's low. One and one. Tony Kubek was describing it last week. Boddicker throws what they call here a fosh, which is a combination fork ball and changeup. And they get the name because of the fork ball FO and what they call the fish, a dead fish changeup. So they combine it, and that's how they get the name. As Morgan swings and misses, and that name is in the fish. And that was it. What tremendous motion he has. Uh, if you're standing in home plate looking at uh, Boddicker throw that ball, as he releases, it looks like a fastball, but it just doesn't get up there. Two balls, two strikes. Boddicker, who struck out 14 against the White Sox, working on Morgan in the first. And that one fooled Joe, but the plate umpire, Vargo, says no. Sometimes your reputation helps out, and Morgan has drawn more walks than anybody in National League history. As it passed the hitter, it could have been just the least bit high. Bulk out, borderline pick. There he goes, and the ball that he turned over. Same motion on that pitch, and if he's going to throw that pitch on three and two, there's no way that a hitter can stand there and be ready for it. Just an outstanding pitch, and Joe is way in front of the ball. Well, Boddicker in six pitches gives you a pretty good demonstration right off the bat as to what type of a pitcher he is. And Joe Morgan's going back to the dugout right now saying to his teammates, you're going to have to wait on the ball. You're going to have to wait on the ball. Pete Rose, one for four last night, looks at one in the third and the count is one ball and no strikes. The field in good shape. The outfield is wet. It rained last night. It rained, of course, throughout the game last night and then through the morning and the early afternoon here. And Rose takes a fastball for a strike, one and one. It's been many years ago, but this fellow reminds me a little bit of Stu Miller, who was uh, master of the changeup, and the ball never got up to home plate. Rose reaching out and fouling it away. The pitching coach, Ray Miller, refers to Boddicker as a left-handed or a right-handed Scott McGregor. So... You get a pretty good idea after watching last night's game as to the type of stuff you'll see anyway tonight. Scotty has an outstanding changeup, but the one that Boddicker threw to Morgan and the one that he used in the American League Championship game was just outstanding. It's one of the best I've seen. Yet you have said repeatedly that a McGregor becomes more effective the more tired he gets, and yet I've heard you say the same thing about Boddicker. Yeah, well... One thing McGregor can do, and Boddicker's going to have to show me, is throw that high fastball up out the strike zone to some of these centers. He just tried it right, right there. there. Just tried it right there and see if he can get it by. He wasted that one. The count two balls and two strikes. Foul away again. Pete Rhodes. At the age of 42, it's the Phillies' option, remember, whether or not they want Rose back next year. Bill Giles, the president, along with Paul Owens and the staff, will make that decision sometime after the series. Full count, three and two. We're back to three and two now, and we'll stay if he stays, see if he stays with the same pattern of an off-speed pitch. Boddicker from Norway, Iowa, 26 years old, and strike three full. The fastball up and away. Fastball up and away, so they can't go back to the dugout and say that we can look for off-speed pitches at three and two. He's thrown one off-speed pitch on three and two, and one fastball on three and two, and both of them in perfect spots. And Pete knew it. Turned and briskly walked away. 
Now he faces Schmidt. Think about a kid who starts the season in the minor leagues and then about six months later tell him in the World Series you will begin the game by striking out Joe Morgan and Pete Rose. He just did it. One and other count. This is the guy who lit a fire under his team with a public outburst during the season. Grounded down to short. That's an easy play for Cal Ripken. And Barker has a one, two, three inning. So Morgan and Rose strike out. Smith grounds out. And after a half, it's the Phillies. Nothing. And the Orioles coming up. Pete Rose is at first base for Philadelphia. And at second base, of course, Joe Morgan. The veteran right side of the infield. And then the... The youthful one, Yvonne De Jesus, who's only 30, the youngest member of the foursome, with Mike Schmidt over at third. The outfield, Gary Matthews remains in left. He had been platooned at points uh, during the middle of the season, but he's in tonight. He had a hot championship series, of course. And then in center field, they go with Greg Gross with Houston and the Cubs, and the Phillies is a part-time player for the past couple of years, and now in a platoon role, and in right field, as was the case last night, a player who started the season in San Diego. It was 6 0 Liscano yesterday. It's Joe LaFay tonight. He came over in a deal for Sid Manji in May. Bo Diaz is back of the plate for Philadelphia. And on the mound is a rookie pitcher who was just about as impressive as Barker in the playoffs, Charles Hudson, who picked the beauty on Friday afternoon against the Dodgers in game three. Here in Baltimore, as you look around, a park that opened in 1954, 309 down the line, then it fans out. 376 in the alleys, 405 to straightaway center. It has warmed up. I would guess right now the temperature is in the 70s. It's also very humid. The humidity is extremely high, but there's no rain. And the flags, quite in contrast to last night, are almost left. Just barely a breath of a breeze. Your attention, please. What we have here is uh, almost a perfect night for baseball. Number one. And of course, sold out Memorial Stadium. Some of these folks lucky enough to have tickets, of course, to the games in Philly as well, because Philadelphia is only a two-hour drive up I-95. We'll be there Friday night for game number three. Bottom of the first inning with Al Bumbrey to lead off, then Danny Ford and Cal Ripken. Bumbrey last night hit a couple of balls on the nose but at people and then doubled in the eighth. So he was one for four. One and the count. Charles Hudson starting the season with the Portland Club in the Pacific Coast League. Made 26 starts this year. And throws a strike on the inside part. One and one. 91 miles per hour. The clocking on Hudson's last pitch. This young man from Prairie View A&M is a real power pitcher with astonishing poise for one who's been in baseball such a short period of time. He's only 24. He's really been in baseball only three years. And he was a low round selection. The 12th pick in 1981. Bumbrey fouls it back. One of the things the Phillies had in mind in winter ball when Pat Corrales was still the manager and the scout Hugh Alexander was down there along with Paul Owens looking at some players, they wanted a pitcher ready to come up if needed during the season. And so they designated in their own minds Hudson and he'd be the man. He didn't know it until he was called up. Fouled away and a count one ball and two strikes. One thing the scouting reports show on Hudson that the Baltimore Orioles know about, of course, uh, they know that Hudson threw that pitch 91 miles an hour, so they're going to have to get those bats going. But they figure that when Hudson gets behind on a 2-0-3-1 counter 3-2, he'll be coming in with that good hard fastball, and they might be ready for it. Two balls, two strikes to count on Al Bumbrey. His 8-8 eight eight, won and lost record, utterly deceiving. He had a streak where he won five straight when it counted most during the season. His performance in the playoffs spoke for itself. Fouled away. Also, in a way, he pitched a little better down the stretch, I think, than people gave him credit for, even though he didn't pitch with a lot of success. He kept them in some games in which he didn't wind up with a W toward the end. And not only did he finish at 500, 8-8, eight eight, he was 4-4 four and four at home, he was 4-4 four and four at the road, and he had nearly identical ERAs home and road.
little squibber, and it's a fair ball. Diaz throws him out. So Bumbrey is gone, one away in the first inning. And we'll take a look at Dan Foy. Last night's game, as you take a look at ERAs in September, and evidence right there, Hudson 208, even though, as I say, he didn't win with regularity. He kept them in games. Last night's game, just about controversial free. In fact, if you had to look for anything at all controversial, you've got to go down to the hit Renneke instead of Ford in the eighth inning. But that's really stretching it. It was a quickly paced game. Two hours and 22 minutes, and that's about as fast as you see a World Series game played these days. Ford has hit 276 against right-handed pitchers, Al, against lefties, 287. Dwyer, the man bench tonight in favor of Dan, who had a hot bat last night, has hit 279 against righties. But Ford, as Earl pointed out earlier in the telecast, has been the basic regular. One and one. Ford's the type of player that can really get hot, and uh, after sitting out last night, maybe he'll have one of those five or six game hot streaks, uh, similar to Matthews had in the uh, National League playoff series, and that's what Al Tabelli's looking for right now. One ball, two strikes account. Ford coming back, as you look at the first year manager of the Orioles, Joe Al Tabelli. Al Tabelli, a longtime minor league manager when Earl was here. Al Tabelli was at Rochester in AAA. Then he finally got a big league break with the Giants and lasted there nearly three seasons. Then was fired at San Francisco. Coach for the Yankees at third base last season. Two and two. Ford almost walked into the pitch with that close stance. Yes, he did. A Nine. second to go. I'm sorry, Earl. You had a glimpse of the man who means so much who's on the bench, Ken Singleton. Well, they definitely missed him last night. There he is, Rick Dempsey, sitting to Ken's right. Left to be a screen. They're going to have to have someone who is not expected to get hot as the ball hits Schmidt at third base. And Mike fields it and throws the first. It's an easy play for the second out, two down. They're going to have to have somebody who isn't expected to get hot. That hasn't led them all year to get hot in this series. Maybe it's a Ford, maybe it'll be a Dempsey, maybe it'll be a Dollar. I'm sorry, they have to have Ed Murray hitting the way he can hit to win this series. Well, that's true also, Howard. Here is Cal Ripken. Sexto Lescano was quoted today as saying he felt that outside of Ripken and Murray, there wasn't a whole lot to worry about in the Oriole lineup. One and no. Well, with the ball game that Denny pitched against him last night, it would appear that way. Bay is coasting over. Remember, only 3.09 into the corner, but he has room to make the catch. And the Orioles are gone in order. So both clubs go out one, two, three, and after one, there's no score in game two. But a very poor start. He was bothered by injuries earlier in the season. He discussed them. I played a lot injured the first part of the year. I had my legs were bothering me, and, I, and I'm just not a good hitter without strong legs because I'm not a very big person, so I hit with my legs. And I had a lot of problems early in the season. I got well about the middle of August, completely well, I should say. And from that point on, I hit the ball real good. But by the time I got well, we were really platooning me, and I wasn't playing every day. After I got hot the end of August, I started playing every single day against left-handers and everybody, and that's why I had such a good September. Joe Morgan talking about his ailments as Joe LaFay leads off in the second inning. This kid's got a quick, quick bat. When he first came up with the Yankees, it looked like he'd become a star with the Yankee ball club. Then they found weaknesses, vulnerabilities, and he was sent away. I don't believe he's got too many weaknesses. I believe he's a real good ball player. I thought like he did, he was really going to help the Yankee ball player. And a fastball blows him away. So Boddicker is showing you everything. The pitch they call the Fox. He's turning it over. And here, just pure heat. A little bit out of the strike zone. He's going to tease him with some of those fastballs. I think, Earl, a word must be mentioned about a remarkable. That pitch, by the way, was 90 miles an hour. Bodic is fastest. 
word must be mentioned about the groundskeeper here. The remarkable job that's been done by Pat Santarone. It's almost unbelievable. Uh, the nice grass he's got out there with four football games in one play just last night. I remember playing World Series here where all the grass was worn off in the outfield. And if it rained, there'd be big mud puddles out there. Gary Matthews takes outside. He used a chemical agent, Al, as you look at Paul Owens with the ever-present Bobby Wine next to him. He used a chemical agent that is a drying agent. Some think he might be the best. Yeah, some. The groundskeeper at Kansas City is great. George Toma. George Toma. Exactly. But Pat Santarone and I were together in Elmira, New York, in Class A baseball. Matthews hits a bouncer down to third. A nice convenient hop for Todd Cruz. And that's five in a row. The first five set down by Mike Foniker. Cruz, by the way, might have as good an arm as any infielder in the American League. Two down. And Neil McCarls, he's a sports writer from Toronto. He takes a poll every year of the ball players. And Todd consistently was voted the best infield arm in the American League. Better than Aurelio Rodriguez. This is after Aurelio was oh, not playing okay. regular. Here is Greg Gross, who takes a strike. Greg Gross, an interesting career, came up with Houston. He was a starter there. He doesn't have much power. Spray hitter likes to go the other way. Then to the Cubs, mainly on the bench, as he bounces it down a second. But playing part-time right now. Another 1-2-3 inning, and the Phillies have not hit the ball out of the infield. So Boddicker now, going back to the regular season, has thrown 16 consecutive scoreless innings. No score going to the bottom of the second. Game three will be played Friday night. The time's at the bottom of the screen. Mike Flanagan will be on the mound for Baltimore. Steve Carlton will work for Philadelphia. Tomorrow is an off day. And then back on Friday... A day game on Saturday and a late afternoon Eastern time game on Sunday, if there is a Sunday. Well, there'll be a Sunday if there's a game on Sunday. I would hope. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Eddie Murray in the bottom for the second inning. Baltimore certainly hopes there'll be a Sunday. No score in the bottom of the second inning. By the way, when we moved to Philadelphia, the Phils had the best home record in the National League. The Birds had the best road road record in the American League. Interesting contrast. Murray hits it high in the air to left center field. Loping over is Gross to make the catch. One away. Lowenstein coming up. Gross platooning in center. Lowenstein, of course, platoons in left for Baltimore. And he talks about it. Oh, absolutely. And I think it's essential to the uh, psychological welfare of the player involved to be uh, told something like that because uh, immediately Earl let me know uh, what uh, was going to be expected of me and I appreciated that and I did not deviate from that course and uh, being a situation uh, type player that I am I, I kind of loved uh, playing in that role as a matter of fact I had no desire to play full time we have so many guys in this ball club that uh, lend support toward a winning effort uh, in, in the same capacity that uh, I'm actually thrilled to be able to part of it Lowenstein talks about platooning. He winds up wrapping a double into the gap in right center field. Look at that graphic. Last 85 home runs hit off right hand. John told me once he stayed in a ball game. We were winning big, and I didn't pinch hit for him. He struck out against the left hander. He says, don't ever do that to me. <laughs> Here is Rich Dower. 0 for 3 last night. So now let's see if we... See some punch in the bottom of the Oriole lineup, which was missing last night. Out of the six, seven, eight, and nine spots last night, the Orioles were a collective 0 for 12. Lowenstein at second base, one out in the bottom of the second inning. Blocked by Diaz, and the count is one and one. Rich Starr is a type of hitter if he's not hitting, and he had an off year. Gets anxious and swings at bad pitches. I think Rich could be the offensive player they're looking for if he could be patient and get strikes. Drive the ball to left field and to right field. A lot of people have told me he's quit trying to hit the ball to right field when the pitchers have gone away from him. One ball, one strike. In the air to left center field. And an easy fly ball for Matthews. And tagging at second and on his way to third is Lowenstein. And the throw is well off the mark. 
Dajon Lowenstein taking advantage of the arm of Gary Matthews, which is relatively strong, but quite erratic. Well, he misplayed the fly ball. He had to go back at the last minute, and I think that's why John decided to tag up and go to third base. But I do want to say that that outfield, it has rained all day, and that outfield is just the least bit wet, and we could see some outfielders slip on it before the night's over. That's also a good scouting report, obviously, on the part of the Orioles, because that's about the way Matthews plays every routine fly ball. Well, he, he certainly catches him. He catches him. He catches him, but he, as he caught that ball, he was not in a position to throw. Which Lowenstein immediately realized. As for the slippage factor in the outfield, that chemical drawing agent I told you about. As Cruz hits it in the air to center field, Gross went the wrong way but has time to recover. He started back as Cruz hit that one off the end of the bat, but he had plenty of time to recover as the ball just hung up. So they strand Lowenstein at third after a double, and we've played two in Baltimore with no score. On Saturday, World Series game four early, and following that, NCAA college football, top-ranked Nebraska taking on Missouri at Missouri following the fourth game of the World Series. Third inning, Al Michaels, Howard Cosell, Earl Weaver in the third. No score, Diaz, De Jesus, and Hudson against Boniker, who has retired the first six. He has struck out three. Hasn't allowed a ball out of the infield. What a go. Getting back to that slippage factor, there may be some, but remarkably little, I think, Earl. You didn't see it as Gross came in for Cruz's short line. And that chemical drawing agent that Pat Santarone used, he laid it all over under the grass, a half inch in. And he says it's the most remarkable effect. Takes all the water out. One and two to count. Well, Gross took a couple steps back on that ball and then recovered. And if, if it was real slippery, yeah. that was a ball that might have dropped in. Exactly. Also, the field in outstanding shape, as you pointed out last night, Howard. Football game played here last Sunday. There'll also be another Colts game here this Sunday as it's popped up on the right side. Dower and Murray are there. One away. On the subject of football, this town talking about the Colts as well as the Orioles because they're four and two. By the way, I've got a trivia question for you. Who's Wait a second. Look at Bodica. Steadily better during the course of a game. And that gets back to the question I raised with Earl. Ongoing fatigue seems to produce greater efficiency. Well, that's true now. But uh, this kid shows a lot of heart. And a lot of young pitchers, when they come up, when they can smell that victory, reach back and get just a little bit extra. Hey, Jesus takes the ball. Let me get back to that trivia question I was going to ask you, Coach. Yeah. Only man to play under Earl Weaver and Frank Cush, who would it be? Played for Earl Weaver and Frank Cook. Reggie Jackson. You've got it. <laughs> How'd you know that, Howard? Somebody in the trucks had it out. <laughs> <laughs> Chuck Howard, who loves college football, of course, as it's grounded to short and Ripken goes to Murray again. Two down. Reggie played here in 1976 under Earl. Played at Arizona at, State was, under Frank. He was an outstanding defensive back as a sophomore. Defensive back? Yes, he Man, was. That should have been a fullback. Well, he was a defensive back the because... Pitcher, number 49. Man could play. But then Bobby Winkles got a hold of him, and that was that. Two down. Base is empty, and Charles Hudson is the batter. Charlie Finley got a hold of him. Yeah, after Winkles. A strike in the count on one starting out like last night's game. We said that this would be a hotly contested pitcher's series. These are two very balanced clubs. We don't know what's going to happen in this ball game, but uh, Friday night we're going to get Mike Flanagan, a uh, former Cy Young Award winner, and Carlton, four-time Cy Young Award winner. Ball grounded back to Potter. We got the throwing the knee, throws the knee. And three up and three down, and that's nine consecutive outs. And none of the Phils has hit the ball out of the infield after two and a half. Philadelphia nothing. And Baltimore nothing.
interesting story. The brilliant running back of the University of Oklahoma, Marcus Dupree, suspended from the Sooners for failure to appear at practice Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, said to be, in fact, in seclusion back in Jackson, Mississippi. Be interesting to see if Coach Switzer takes him back. Should uh, Marcus desire to come back? Meanwhile, here, most of the bats have been in seclusion as we play two and a half. John Lowenstein has the only hit in the game, a double in the second inning. Baltimore comes up in the bottom of the third inning with Dempsey, Boddicker, and Bumbry. One and zero on Dempsey, who hit 231 during the regular season with four homers and 32 runs batted and over two last night. One and one. Hudson's getting his fastball in some pretty good spots right now. He is a good-looking young pitcher. And if you were around that Philadelphia dugout tonight, you saw a team with self-belief. They are really a confident ball club now. Well, being up one game in a seven-game series will do that for you. And having a lot of fellas who have been around, Rose and Morgan and Perez and Carlton and Reed and Schmidt and Maddox, who's not playing tonight. The 2 1 pitch is going in a mess from the count. And down goes uh, 2 and 2 is what the scoreboard says. And Dempsey says, Now watch the count. The board said 2 and 1. And Dempsey said, I thought it was 2 and 1. What are you laughing at, Rick? Now it says two and two. Now Diaz is arguing. He won the argument. Well, Diaz is saying, now what is the deal here? The deal is it's two and two. Your call was correct. The scoreboard was wrong. Ed Vargo, who is the senior umpire in the National League, <laughs> he's been through this before. He is saying it is two and two. Well, the umpire is going to be right because he holds a little indicator in his hand with three balls and two strikes in it. And he, he turns the wheel every time so he can look down and see. Popped up and Joe Morgan is there to the right of second base to pull it in. So Dempsey is gone anyway. One out in the third inning. And a hand for the pitcher Mike Boddicker who's become an instant hero in this city. And well should be. You know, there's a great similarity between these two great pitching staffs. Each finished second in the league in earned run average. And Boddicker showing that he can swing the bat with that cut. He went after that one. He's not going to stand there and take. That pitch was up out of the strike zone. The Phillies staff's earned run average was 3.34. The Birds 3.63. Here's the indicator that being held by Margo, to which the Earl referred. Used to use that when you're growing up in Los Angeles at Alexander Hamilton High School, didn't you? Absolutely, and before that in Brooklyn. We just had an excellent shot of the indicator. It was in the left hand, and you could see it when Vargo went down and put his left hand on his left knee. Two balls and a strike. And it's fouled away, and the count two and two. At the University of Iowa, Boddicker played third base one year. So at least he's not a total stranger when it comes to swinging the bat. He's had two good swings, so it doesn't look like he's going to be an automatic out. Bonica moved from Cedar Rapids to Norway. Norway, Iowa. Strike three as Hudson finds the outside corner. Bonica goes down. That's the, the first strikeout for Charles Hudson. Another look. Boddicker didn't think this pitch was a strike. He turned around and looked at Vargo, but it tailed back in and got a good portion of the corner. What he might have said is, that don't forget, if I put the same pitch right there. You've got the to same, say that before the, you go the back. Same call, yeah. Two out, base is empty, and Al Bumbery is the batter. Postseason, meaning playoffs and World Series, as you looked at the graphic, 2 to 13 in postseason play. Two out, nobody on, with no score in the bottom of the third. One and oh. Look in from just about the right field foul pole. One and one. Bumbry stepping out. 
Again tonight, we've got two pitchers that work fairly quick, and I wouldn't be surprised to see more hitters stepping out, trying to break their rhythm. Both staffs feature pitchers that work quickly. Of course, on Friday night, we're going to see Steve Carlton, who works as quickly as anyone. pitch in a better spot than that's that it. He really threw that pitch. That's what I was about to say. Just beautiful. There it is again. Knee high outside corner. How can you hit that pitch? One two to Bumpery is up high in the count. Two balls and two strikes. You mentioned earlier Al that Bumbery was swinging well last night a far cry from his dismal performance in the 79 series and I think you're right. He is he looks determined. Count stays two and two in the Philadelphia dugout. Tony Perez man in the middle right there who started the season very very hot. In fact he helped to carry this club early he was making several strikes at first base and then he tailed off and assumed the role for which he was signed pinch hitter and Bumbery takes strike three and Al a normally very affable and happy sort expresses his displeasure with Vargo so Hudson painting the corners here in the third inning throwing perfect pitches to Boddicker and again Bumbery strike two is a perfect pitch and as we go out, take a look at strike three. And we played three with no score in Baltimore. We go to the fourth inning. No score. Mike Boddicker works on Joe Morgan, who struck out his first trip, and he takes a strike. Boddicker has been perfect through three. He has struck out three. Hasn't allowed a ball out of the infield. Five grounders. Over two. This should be a very interesting inning, though. The Reds, uh, the Reds, you'll look at Joe Morgan, Pete Rose, all of them. It's almost inevitable. The Phils will be looking at Vodka second time around. Rounded toward the hole. Ripken was playing up the middle, knocks it down, and that's all. Morgan, a full hitter. So Ripken was playing over toward the middle, and he's been playing over toward the middle more since Todd Cruz was acquired at third. Cruz has more range than Hernandez did. And this time he had to go back and couldn't make the play. First baseman, Pete Rose. There it is. Ordinarily, he'd get that ball. You'll see him slip just slightly on this grass right here. The ball hit on the heel of his glove. But if he gets it, does he get Morgan? He's got a good shot because last night he showed us he could th throw from the hole. That scored as an infield hit, and Morgan goes. Rose takes outside. Morgan got a good jump and steals it. It was a close play, and Boddicker is upset at the call at second base, and so is Ripken. He's disgruntled as well. Morgan got a tremendous jump. I want to see this again. You just don't steal on Rick Dempsey. It was a perfect throw, Howard. It comes in knee high right there. A little bit higher than knee high. There goes the hand into the bag, and I believe Good the call. got it right. Good call. He didn't steal it on Rick Dempsey. He stole it on Boddicker. You're right. He had a walking lead and was going immediately and gets it. He's there. That angle proving it very conclusively. No argument at all. Frank Pulley, the umpire at second. Rose bluffs a butt, and the count is now 2-0. Now that shows that Paul Owens has just a little bit of respect for Boddicker and he's going to try to get that runner from second over to third with uh, should Pete Bunt with one out. Rose laying it down and Morgan has to hold. Dempsey throws and gets him. So Rose made what at first appeared to be a perfect bunt, but he didn't get it out far enough and Morgan sensing that Dempsey was going to make the play was frozen. It's hard to believe the agility of Rick Dempsey. And you can carry a hitter that hits 224 when uh, he can do defensively the things that we just watched him do. That's why, despite the paucity of power in the bottom of that batting order, Joe Altabelli remains loath to bench Dempsey in order to get Nolan's better bat in there. He's exactly not going right. to do it. And Dempsey remains the leader of this team in spirit, in know-how, in everything. Mike Smith standing in it. Little butt right there. A perfect illustration of the difference between grass and astroturf. In Philadelphia, that's a sacrifice butt because it takes that kangaroo little hop on the turf. And Morgan advances. That's definitely true. Smith 
Schmidt grounded out in the first inning. Mike is looking for his first hit in the series. He's 0 for 5. Pickoff play is on. Morgan getting back as Dower had cut in behind on a timing play. That's a play that the Orioles don't hesitate to use. Even if they don't get him, might keep Joe Morgan a step closer to second base should Mike get a base hit. And with Schmidt, a full hitter, Dower is pushed over toward the middle anyway, so Morgan can't get a big lead as Boddicker throws it up and in. Last night, the first few, few times up, they pitched Mike Schmidt outside. I see they're going in and out with him tonight. Two balls and no strikes to count. One out, fourth inning. No score. You know, the way the wind was blowing to left field last night can influence a pitcher's thinking as far as pitching right-handed hitters away. One out and miss, and the count now two balls and one strike on Mike Smith. Amplify what you meant with that, Earl. Well, you get the ball on the inside half of the plate, it gives a right-hand uh, hitter a much better chance to pull the ball. And if you make a mistake, you'd rather make it on the outside half where he has to hit the ball to center field or right field. 2-1 to Schmidt. Missing away, ball three. A look at how the defense is aligned. As you can see, Dower, the second baseman, will over, and Murray, 25 feet off the line at first. Three and one, LeFay is on deck. And Morgan goes. He got another good jump. This is grounded to short. It's Ripken who throws to first, and Murray can't make the play. He got handcuffed. Morgan is at third. The so runners at first and third with one out, and LaFay coming up. And Morgan's talking to Bristol at third. The way he indicated that with his hands to Dave, it was almost as if maybe he should have sent me in on that. See, Morgan was at third. Murray gets handcuffed at first base. It's hard to believe, but what I believe happened on that play is Eddie Murray was conscious of the fact that Joe Morgan might score, and as the ball was coming across the infield, I believe he took his eye off of the ball and watched to see if Morgan was going to go. I believe you're 100% right, and you could almost see him instinctively looking over to third base to see if Joe was making the turn and sprinting in. Infield looking for the double play, and they said high in the air to center field. If it stays in, it's deep enough to score a run. Bumbry makes the catch, and both runners are tagging as Schmidt slides into second with Morgan crossing the play. So LaFay delivers a sacrifice fly, and Philadelphia takes a one to nothing lead here in the fourth inning. This team is playing opportunistic baseball. This team is doing everything right, these Phillies. They forced that run. It was Baltimore that made the mistake, and it wasn't Bodica's fault. That's the first run scored against him in 17 and two-thirds innings. Fantastic streak. And it's also an unearned run, because that would have been the third out. Matthews is the batter and takes a strike. The scoring on Schmidt's ball, Ripken gets an assist. And then Murray gets the error at first base. Six to E3. LaFay follows with a sacrifice fly. And so with two outs, Schmidt at second. And Owen won the count on Matthews. Who so hits it in the air to center field. And Al Bumbry will put this one away. But Murray's error is costly. As the Phillies score an unearned run here in the fourth inning, we'll hit one error, one left in the middle of the fourth. At Memorial Stadium in Baltimore, it's Philadelphia 1, Baltimore nothing in Game 2 of the 1983 World Series. Bottom of the fourth inning, Philadelphia leading 1 to nothing with Dan Ford, Cal Ripken, and Eddie Murray to face the rookie Charles Hutchins. By the way, the last time two rookies linked up in a World Series game, 1981 Game 3 at Dodger Stadium, Dave Rigetti pitched for New York, Fernando Valenzuela pitched for Los Angeles, and that was a classic game. Ah, uh, yes, I remember it well. That's when they put Bobby Brown in center field and bench Jerry Mumphrey, and that turned the, the tide of events. But in the meantime, 
I tell you, that kid LaFay hit that ball a ton, and the ball is hanging heavy in this sultry air. I thought it was out of there. He hit it to the deepest part of the ballpark, Howard. Any place else would have had a real good chance of going out. Ford swinging and missing 0-1. Charles Hudson on the mound for the Phillies and showing remarkable poise and composure as he did on Friday against the Dodgers. He was staggering at one point in that game. But continued on. They're so proud of him down at Prairie View AM now. A school that turned out one of the greatest football players I have ever seen. One and two. And that man's name was number 89, Otis Taylor. Charles Hudson is certainly painting that outside corner. He's thrown some pitches that have been unhittable up to this point. One two pitch coming up. He got him swinging. So he has struck out three and they are successive. He got Boddicker and Bumbrey on perfect pitches in the third and blows this one right by Dan Short. His confidence seems to be bubbling now. Yes it is and he had a good second half of the season and a good game in the playoffs and confidence builds more confidence. He feels right now that he can throw that ball wherever he wants to and he's throwing it hard. Ripken is the batter. A strike. They started to call him Charlie when he first came up. He doesn't care, but he said, hey, look, my mom wants to be known as Charles. This is when he has to be careful. 0-2. Oh, Had him chasing that a little. Well, I'm sure... 94. Hmm. I'm sure the book on Cal Ripken Jr. is that he's a very good low ball hitter. Looks like Hudson is trying to stay up in the strike zone to him. In the air to center field and an easy play for Greg Gross. So two down and now they're getting on Eddie Murray a little bit as he comes up. His postseason problems have been well documented of course. You and speak of the 79 series. Absolutely and also the playoffs. He hit that monstrous home run in Chicago the other day, but outside of that, not much else. Well, he may he felt so embarrassed about dropping that throw. In the upper half of the inning, you can see his discomfiture as he went into the dugout. That may fire him up. And if Eddie does something here, it might fire up the whole Oreo ball club. They must have him producing if they are to have a chance to win. took enough off it in the count one and one again if you're just tuning in Morgan a single and a steal and then Murray dropped the throw from Ripken with Morgan going to third LeFay hit a sacrifice fly in the top of this inning and it's one to nothing half swing as he tried to duck away from it in the count one and two Howard you said that Eddie has to do it well Eddie himself knows he has to do it and that puts a little extra pressure on him he's trying real hard right now and he might be over trying And a pitch he tries to fight off. Gets jammed and grounds it to Schmidt, who ranges halfway to second. And down he goes. And so Hudson, in four innings, has faced one over the minimum. He's retired 12 of 13, and we'll go to the fifth. The Phillies won, and the Orioles nothing. In the World Series, back with you Friday at 8, Saturday 12.30 Eastern time, and then college football following that Nebraska against Missouri Saturday afternoon. Here in the fifth inning, Mike Boddicker working on Greg Gross. Owen won the count. Gross, Diaz, and De Jesus. Philadelphia leading one to nothing. One and one. That's the machine the Phillies use to tape their people as they bat. And they have a monitor in the dugout with it also. Rounded down to short. Ripken going first. One away. And a Montier goes up for Murray. And they can go in. The minute that uh, they come back from home plate and go in and rerun that tape and see what they look like. Catcher. And the Ball. last at bat. Diaz. Bo Diaz comes up. Popped out in the third inning. Still can't get over that catch of Lowenstein's yesterday, and I don't blame him. 
0 and 1. That ball was out of here. I don't know how Lowenstein got his his hand back, ball in the glove, without bumping into the fence. Without bumping into the fence, it was an amazing feat. No balls, two strikes to count. There has not been a walk in either game to this point. Yesterday's game, only the fourth in series history. Make it the fifth. fifth. It had been fourth without a walk. And we're uh, possibly on our way to another. Well, the odds against that are pretty staggering. Well, this could be another of those one-run games. And who is it that says good teams never lose close decisions or one-run games? Because Baltimore this year won 20 and lost 19 in one-run games. And the Bills won 23 and lost 23 in one-run games. So neither team has been outstanding in that regard. And it's called strike three. Bo Diaz fooled, probably looking for the fastball, and gets a breaking pitch on the inner part of the plate. Good curveball. That was a curveball that Mike Boddicker started at the hitter. He backs off of it a little bit and it breaks back over the plate. Looked like Dempsey giving a little bit of help there when he pulled it inside, too. Four strikeouts for Boddicker. And so Avon De Jesus comes up, grounded out in the third inning. Phillies one, Orioles nothing in the fifth. A strike. Boddicker finished second in the American League in earned run average this season. As it's bounced down to Murray, he'll shovel. And the out is recorded to retire the side. So that's the fourth one, two, three inning for Boddicker. But the Phillies scored in the fourth, and after four and a half, it's still one to nothing Philadelphia. That'll happen here in Baltimore. Right now they're down one game to nothing. They're down one run to nothing in game number two. As we go to the bottom half of the fifth inning. Lowenstein, Dower, and Cruz come up against the rookie Charles Hudson. Lowenstein with 15 home runs during the regular season. He has the only Baltimore hit. A double in the second inning. Hudson taking some time to clean off his spikes. And Charles will get ready to go to work here in the bottom of the fifth inning. now are trying to get something started trying to give the home team a little bit of help for the baseball purist the aficionado so to speak both games have been picture games pitchers do pitchers do it infrequent mistakes in the field Eddie Murray's tonight one that stands out but the average fan likes to see runs runs and more runs and home runs so for them no. In the air to center field and deep. They may be looking at a home run right here. They have. And they are. There's a little of the excitement you were talking about, especially for the hometown fans, huh? It was a fastball over the outside half of the plate that John seemed to be looking for. He seemed to creep up just a little bit on the plate. He went out and got it I hope and hit it right back up the middle. Get to see it again right here. Tailing away just a little. John up a little closer on the plate. Got all of that ball. Hit it over the 405 sign in center field. I hope nobody asked him in the clubhouse after the game, what did you hit? Do you remember what his answer well, was? Yeah, he, that. he said, I hit a home run. The writers usually <laughs> want to find out what type of pitch hit, curveball, fastball, changeup. Every time they asked John what he hit, he said, I hit a homer. <laughs> and to the deepest part of the park, and it really carried on a windless, breezeless night. 
0-1 the count on Dower, who fouls it straight back. And it's interesting, the games have been low scoring, as you pointed out, Howard, and another look right here. There have been five runs in the two games. That's not very many, but four home runs. And the other unearned. Right. Dower hit a home run in game seven of the 79 World Series. And that was the only run the Orioles scored. Everybody remembers Starkle's home run that day. And Pittsburgh won it. Crowd has really come alive. One ball, two strikes to count. On Dower. Hudson continues to make good pitches with that fastball on the outside half of the plate. I believe that all of the Oriole uh, hitters are going to have to do what Lowenstein did. Get up on that plate just a little bit. Rips in the left. That's the base hit. the first base in the bottom of the fifth inning. That pitch was on the inside half of the plate right there and Dower got good wood on the ball. Todd Cruz comes up. So that's the first hit that hit by Dower is the first hit the Orioles in two games have gotten out of the six, seven, eight, or nine hitter. But by Cruz, Smith with bare hand, and Smith had a double clutch. Everybody safe to throw to second, too late there. Joe Morgan was not expecting the sacrifice, and he was just a little bit late getting to first base. And that's the reason why Smith double clutched it. Here it is. A good sacrifice attempt laid right down the third baseline. Smith comes in, makes a nice play. He's ready to throw, and there's no one there. He had a hold up. By the time Morgan got there, Smith was off balance and made a low throw. And Joe never did really get to the base, as you viewers just saw. And that's really astonishing because Morgan, the teacher, really makes a mental mistake. That's true. Uh, we got the seventh hitter at the plate with Todd Cruz. I, I can understand why they might not be expecting a sacrifice bunt with the eighth hitter, Rick Dempsey, and the pitcher coming up to drive him in. Yeah, would you bunt with the pitcher coming up next? I think I'd give it a shot. You got a left-handed hitter in Al Bumbry if Bodica doesn't give him in. And I said, the not first... only that, Bodica takes a pretty good swing. The first time up, Bodica had some pretty good cuts. At least he looked like he wanted to hit the ball. Meanwhile, you've got Osteen, Owens, and Wine. As they look on, Dempsey stands in. Rose is at the edge of the grass at first. Smith is even with the bag. Morgan and De Jesus are halfway. Dempsey will swing away and takes low ball one. Well, I was about to say, if I'm the defensive manager in this situation, I wouldn't put on any bunt plays where I'd have too many people charging on this because you do have the pitcher coming up uh, behind Rick Dempsey. Dower is at second. And Cruz at first with nobody out. Dempsey on a half swing. It's a strike, one and one. Now well, in the bullpen, Willie Hernandez gets up. The left-hander required from Chicago in May for Dick Ruthven. Joe Altabelli can figure here if, Rumsey, if Dempsey, if give Dempsey a chance to hit, and then he can get the runners over with his pitcher, and Bumbry will still have his shot. Dempsey fouling it back upstairs, straight back, and the count is one ball and two strikes. The one thing you worry about when you don't put that sacrifice going on is the double play ball. With nobody out, bottom of the fifth inning, Dower, who singled, is at second. Cruz was given a base hit on the Smith play. He's at first. And the one-two pitch on its way to Rick Dempsey. is thrown into the right field corner for extra bases. That was for Dower. And on his way to third as the relay gets by De Jesus. It's backed up by Smith. Cruz stops to third. Two to one. Altabelli gave Dempsey a chance to hit the ball, and Dempsey went right with the pitch on the outside half. Did a double to right field. 
So the spirited catcher, the team leader, you don't write him off. The Yankees know all about Dempsey. He was once a Yankee, came to Baltimore in that remarkable trade that brought Scotty McGregor and Tippy Martinez to Baltimore that we discussed yesterday. There goes Claude Osteen out to the mound. Mike Schmidt makes a nice play. As you watch LaFay play it off the wall, he has a tremendous arm, but so good in that particular case, it bypasses De Jesus, and Schmidt is right there to back it up and save a run. And it's a good thing Mike Schmidt was heads up, because two runs might have scored on that play. Exactly so. Again, from this angle, LaFay, a good outfielder, plays it perfectly, and he's in a foreign park. And the throw comes sailing in. But Schmidt saves the run. So two to one Baltimore. With Cruz, the runner at third. Dempsey at second. So the Orioles, whose bottom of the order had been 0 for 16 in two games, all of a sudden, Dower, the six hitter, a single. Cruz, the seven hitter, a bunch single. Dempsey, the eight hitter, a double. And it's two to one. And Paul Owens has decided to play his infield halfway. Boddicker is at the plate. A chopper, and that's foul on one. Now watch this. Watch him reach out. Hit this ball. Take it to right field. That's what you, you always had him do against the Yankees in the clutch, Earl. When he was with the Yankees, he hit the ball a lot to right field against uh, the Baltimore Orioles. Still nobody out. Baltimore leading two to one. Boddicker to be followed by Al Bumbry. That was really a classic evidence of a man going outside, going with the pitch. Up high. One ball, one strike. Outstanding determination by Dempsey. You know, there's a possible chance of a squeeze play here, but I don't I think... I wouldn't risk it here, Earl. I wouldn't risk it here with nobody out. You can no. take yourself right out of the inning. Well, you see the squeeze normally is with one man out. Key to this inning was still the double flex on throw by Schmidt because Morgan wasn't covered. Hits a left field on a line to Matthews. Cruz tags. The catch is made. Here comes the throw. It is not in time. Three to one. And Mike Fodiker had a very good cut at that ball. He really did. Especially after not going to the plate all year long. You know, he hadn't been up the plate. That's why the sleeves were out also. He's not familiar with getting that ball on the ground. Looked like the play might be close. The throw was off. Left side of the plate. So Baltimore leaves it 3-1. to one. Hudson coming into the inning and faced only one man over the minimum. And he's been rocked, and he's also going to be out of the game as you watch Matthews again because Owens is going to the mound at this very moment. Well, Owens is going to the mound because he observed what Earl just observed, that Botica had a real good cut and slap at that ball. So it'll be Hernandez coming in. One out in the fifth inning, three to one. We'll be back after this word from your local station. When the cannon sounds, 17,000 people will take the first steps of what will feel like a lifetime. The New York City Marathon, live October 23rd on ABC. Willie Hernandez, who came over to the Phillies from the Cubs in the deal that sent Dick Ruthman to Chicago on May 22nd, appeared in 63 games as a Philly this season and 11 others with Chicago, so he pitched in 74 total and had a career-high nine victories. Now, in the fourth inning, the Phillies got their run that way. Morgan reaching third on the Murray error and LeFay hitting the sacrifice fly. But here, in the fifth inning, Lowenstein, the home run to dead center. Dower, the solid single. Cruz, the bunt single. With Morgan late covering first base, Dempsey goes to right for a double, and then Boddicker hits a sack fly to Gary Matthews as John Shelby comes off the bench. They platoon in center field, and with Hernandez now pitching, it's Shelby who comes up to bat. And Joe Altabelli is not wasting any time using 
his roster to the fullest in this game. You can see that. And while Bunbury is a pretty good defensive ball player, this fella is considered an outstanding defensive ball player, so that will help him also with the two-run lead. Pop foul and drifting back out of play. No balls, one strike. Earl, the word is, as you look it out, the belly Shelby's the center fielder of the future when Bunbury's done. Do you look at it that way? Oh, definitely. Every Shelby, day? Every, every day, day center fielder. He hits from both sides of the plate. In fact, this fellow hit better in his first year than I thought he might. I, I, I thought uh, he wouldn't be playing as much as he did his first two, one or two years in the big league. Check swing. And it's a strike. They get the call at first base from Al, Al Clark. Al Clark at first base. I think he got it right. John's a little impatient. A little breaking ball in the dirt. What do you think, Aaron? It was a good call. No balls, two strikes. Outside. Interestingly enough, Shelby this season hit 264 against lefties and 310 against righties. I didn't see that many righties, all things considered, with Bumbry playing a lot, but still, a switch hitter and proving he can hit from both sides of the plate. Reaching out, and to count one ball and two strikes. Dempsey, the runner at second. What a way. Please spin been impatient, as most young ball players are when they get to the big leagues. One thing that helped John get into a lot of ball games is he did get off to a good start. Willie Hernandez, who first came up with the Cubs in 1977, the 1-2 pitch is hit foul. Into the upper deck and bounding down below. I also will, uh, I believe that Shelby's going to get stronger as the years pass. And as he learns the pitchers in the American League more, he'll learn to pull more. Some year I think he can hit 15 to 20 home runs. Fernandez, that's interesting right there. Through June, didn't give up a homer. And then from July on, all nine that he yielded this season. In only 15 less innings. Hmm. There's that screwball. He turned that one over. And the count, one ball and two strikes. Interestingly, Hernandez was originally signed by the Phillies. He came up through their minor league system. Then they sent him to the Cubs. He never made it to the big leagues of Philadelphia initially. And then they get him back in the, in the Ruthven deal in May. Most organizations hate to let a ball player get away and perform for another organization. A lot of times they try and get him back. One ball, two strikes to count. Three, one, Baltimore. One out. Bottom of the fifth inning. Screwball found away. Hernandez was in more games than any left-hander in the major. 74, as Al mentioned. The only right-handers he pitched in more games this season for Bill Campbell and a fellow named Ticulte. That's funny. I think I, I would think that Cleasonberry would have been in there with all those mm -hmm. saves that he had. Dan wound up with 45 saves this year, and that's strike three. And Shelby doesn't like the call. He may not like the call, but that was one lovely pitch. He was tied up. Watch this. Had him handcuffed. There's no doubt about it. Inside part of the plate. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Beautiful pitch. Claude Osteen will go to the mound. Dan Ford coming up. As Osteen, the former Dodger left-hander, the pitching coach, and part of what they call a gang of four, so named by Philadelphia writer Bill Conlin earlier this year. And in terms of how the Phillies are guided, as you look at Larry Anderson who was acquired during the season, warming up in the bullpen. But Owens relies on his coaches, Bobby Wine and Dave Bristol, who has a lot of prior managerial experience, and Claude Osteen, Darren Johnson, Mike Ryan. There on the left, of course, is Al Holland. It's much too early for him. Mike Ryan, bullpen coach, also in the picture there. 
Holland to save last night's game. 3-1 Baltimore. Danny Ford at the plate with two down. Foul away out of play. 0-1 oh, the count. Well, in starting Dan Ford against a right-hander, it now turns out that Altabelli saved a ball player. It really does, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Dan's up there against the left-hander. If Jimmy Dwyer were in the ball game, Dan would be coming out of the dugout pinch hitting for him. Two down. Dempsey at second base. Thank God for batting helmets. We faced this situation two years ago when Goose Gossage struck Ron Say in a very similar manner. Just pitch got away, obviously, from Hernandez, who immediately sprinted toward the plate, realizing what had happened. Ford has been beleaguered with bad luck in the late going of this season. Well, that's Ralph Chalvon, the longtime trainer. And Cal Ripken, the third base coach. It sounded like it, it hit the helmet. It sounded like it made contact with plastic right. from here anyway. Well, we can just give our prayers for the fact that that helmet was there. Because once it wasn't. The story of the batting helmet we told you during the World Series two years ago. That's the helmet. It began, really, in 1947 in a game in Columbus, Ohio. Look at this terrible scene again. When a pitcher named Jim Kirk struck the doughty, gritty little Don Zimmer in the head. And they had to put a plate in Don's head. Later, Zimmer would be hit again by a man named Jeff Coat. But Mr. Branch Rickey, as they patch up the eye right there, there's apparently some blood. He, no, wears, no he wears glasses, and of course, uh, they could have shattered upon impact. I think he wants to stay in this game. It looks like he does. It looks like yeah. he's telling Joe Altabelli that he can stay in there. Just to fill out the story, Earl, it's a story you're intimately familiar with. Originally, many batters didn't even want the helmets, and it was optional. But now, that helmet is there. Another look, and of course, as I say, Danny wears glasses, so as the pitch comes in, it may have made contact with the metal frame. Let's see. Difficult to tell exactly where it hit. Looked like the side of the bill, perhaps. Remember, Earl, when you were in the Southern League, New Orleans, uh, Nashville, wasn't it? And uh, was New it? Orleans and uh, Branch Rickey uh, started the helmets in professional baseball, mm -hmm. and all the Pittsburgh affiliates, including the Major League Club, wore the helmets not only offensively but, but defensively. defensively. And when the helmet first came into the Major Leagues, there was a grandfather rule. The people that were there uh, didn't have to wear the helmet by choice, uh, only if they chose to. And there were many players that chose not to wear the helmet, but just a small liner. It's, it's that small liner would never save them to there. Well, the glasses did not shatter. He puts them back on. He acknowledges to the crowd that he's okay. And they respond in kind. Hernandez, the first base open, probably just trying to move him back a little bit. Danny crowds the plate, of course. The glasses flew one way, and of course, we didn't carry through on the picture, but Hernandez moved quickly up to the plate, filled with a very deep concern for the pitch that got away. And it knocked the helmet three feet the other way. Well, it's good to see Dan Ford up. Well, Ford is at first base, and still a second is Dempsey, and the eighth man to come up in the inning is Cal Ripken who has fly to right and fly to center. Ripken in the two games is now one for six. Baltimore leading 3-1, bottom of the fifth. And with Cal Ripken and Eddie Murray coming up, this is the first chance to break one of these ball games wide open. Hernandez, by the way, is due to lead off in the sixth inning. 
So that's why Anderson was up. How much does what happened to Hernandez affect him now, do you think? It's up to the individual, but I'll tell you this, Howard. If I was on the mound, it would affect me. You can't get that kind of thing out of your mind. Sometimes it's really tough. Two balls, no strikes to count. Empty at second. Ford is first. There was a pitcher at California named Tatum who hit Paul Blair in the eye one time and never was effective afterwards. Ken Tatum, yeah. Two and one to count. And one of the reasons that Kevin, although psychology was involved, one of the reasons Kevin so shaped with fear right. of hitting people. I believe you're right. Huh? Two one pitch. Ball three, and the count three and one. There's probably more instances that don't come to mind right off. Well, here. Steve Blash is another felony. All of a sudden, Blash just lost it overnight, and there are a million reasons, I guess. I don't think Steve even knows who this guy. But maybe that was one of them. Three balls and one strike to count on Ripken. Now we can see Ripken's stance here. Back back in the box, almost out of the box, off the plate. He's got to quit swinging the pitches on the outside after the plate. But a looper foul. And the count three and two. He can cover the strike zone, but if it's three or four inches outside, and it looks like that's what they're doing uh, with him, and he's chasing them. He's not going to be able to get any good wood on the ball. Full count, so the runners will go with the pitch. Dempsey from second and Ford from first. And Ripken nubs it foul, so the runners come back. Nubbing it off his foot. Three and two on Cal with Murray on deck, the eighth man to bat here in the inning. That was a good ball, good pitch by Hernandez. That ball was sinking. Tough pitch to hit. Well, that's the science of pitching. He had been on the outside half of the plate and then tried to get under his hands with a sinking fastball. Sinkers and screwball. His stages. As the three-two pitch is outside for ball four. So Eddie Murray comes up with the bases loaded. Now Murray comes up in a different situation, Earl. They're not going to be booing him now, and some of the pressure upon him has been alleviated. He does it. He's ahead. Look at that graphic. Quote. He's a great player. There's no question about it. He doesn't have to worry about his failures in the 79 series now. He doesn't have to worry about the ball he dropped to give the one run to the Phils that they have in this game. He can be a more relaxed hitter, and maybe, maybe he will burst out, show his real ability. One more thing, Howard, is Hernandez has to throw him a strike or walk in a run. Exactly. One and no the count. The walk to Cal Ripken was the first walk not only of the game, but of the series. So one ball, no strikes to count. Eddie Murray at the plate. Murray is one for six in the series. He is wide to center and grounded to third. And he pops it up into center field. Gross says, I'll take it. And does. So nine men come up in the inning. The Orioles get three, thanks to the bottom of the order. And at the end of five, it's Baltimore three, Philadelphia one. John Shelby stays in the game. He pinch hit for Bunbury and takes Al's spot in the fifth inning. And... With Boddicker on the mound, he's taking some extra warm-ups here. Danny Ford took uh, an extra moment or two in the dugout and has just gone out to the right field. As you look at Vaughn Hayes, who will bat here for Hernandez. So Hernandez comes in and works two-thirds of an inning, and Anderson has been warming up in the Philadelphia bullpen. So it's Vaughn Hayes, Joe Morgan, and Pete Rose. Well, let's see what the long rest does, if anything, to a four Bonica, because through five innings, Bonica had thrown 59 pitches, 39 of them for strikes. Three to one, Baltimore. There's Ford, and he's still wiping the area. 
in which the contact was made. As Hayes settles in. Vaughn acquired from Cleveland for five players in the offseason, including Manny Trio and the brilliant young shortstop Julio Franco. Chopper foul. It's funny, when the Phillies left spring training, they figured they had a solid everyday outfield. It was going to be Matthews in left, and the veteran Maddox in center, and the newcomer Hayes in right. And all of a sudden, here they are in the series. Matthews has played in both games, but he's been basically platooning. As Hayes swings and misses, they're platooning in center now with Gross and Maddox. They're platooning in right with Liscano and LaFay. And Hayes not even in the platoon picture at the moment. But as we mentioned last night, those who see this club every day say it's just a matter of time, and Hayes will be in the lineup every day. He certainly looked like a real good ball player against the Baltimore Orioles last year. He drove in 18 runs against us. And when I saw Tippy Martinez before the game, he got him out last night. He said, I finally got that man out, Earl. Two balls, two strikes to count. Boddicker has allowed just one hit, the single by Morgan, and that was an infield hit, and down goes Hayes. So that's five strikeouts for Mike Boddicker. That might have been the Fox, Earl. That definitely was, and a good motion. They just can't hold up on that pitch, and it tails away from the left-handed hitter. The combination fork ball change. As we mentioned before, they get the name, the combination of fork ball and fish, because... Uh, not only the Oriole pitchers, a lot of pitchers call the change up the fish, which is short for dead fish, because it comes up like a dead fish. Morgan takes low, ball one. Lots of one to draw Cruz in, and the count one ball and one strike. Satch Page once said, never look back. Joe Morgan never does. He has the capacity to forget a mistake. He's a profession. Two and one. A look in again from the right field foul pole area. And Joe Morgan is down in front. And the count two balls and two strikes. This is an inter interesting young pitcher. Yes, he is. But to be fair to Charles Hudson, he was moving along beautifully. What undid him in the long run was when Schmidt had no one to throw to at first. That set up the hole in it. That certainly helped. Yes, it did. Uh. Grounded to the right side. Eddie Murray scooping it up, taking care of him. So two down. Hey, with a little bit of luck, Boddicker's pitching a no-hitter at this point. Because oh, Morgan right. has the only hit, that ground ball, to, to the, the right, right of, Ripken, of Ripken. And had he fielded it cleanly, he would have gotten him in all likelihood. And he's that close to pitching a no-hitter right now. Two down, and Pete Rose, the batter, struck out in the first and then bunted in the fourth. He was trying to advance Morgan, and Dempsey made a nice play to hold Morgan in second and get Pete. So Rose didn't get the sacrifice. Right, all right. Give you an evidence of Bonica's effectiveness in the late going this year. His last 10 starts, his ERA was 1.34. That's fantastic. It's unbelievable. You don't see too many pitchers make Morgan and Rose look as bad at the plate as Boddicker has so far tonight. Pete reaches for it and grounds it to third. Cruz with that gun throws him out. So Boddicker has allowed one hit and a run through six. We played five and a half. Baltimore three. Philadelphia one in game two. Don't miss it. Unbeaten Nebraska, the number one team in the nation, battles the upset-minded Missouri Tigers. ABC's NCAA College Football, Saturday. John Lowenstein will lead off in the sixth inning. In the fifth inning, he got things started. The Orioles had been dormant through four. They'd had only one base runner, and then all of a sudden, boom. The home run by Lowenstein to the deepest part of the ballpark, dead center field, with Greg Gross running out of room at the wall. And before the inning was over, nine men had come to the plate. Charles Hudson was gone. The Orioles had scored three and lead it three to one. And Lowenstein will be facing the third Philadelphia pitcher, right-hander Larry Anderson, who has had a spotty career. He's 
been pitching in professional baseball since 1971. He's been a good part of that time in the minors. This year, he spent most of the season in Portland in the Pacific Coast League. He was 7-8 and eight there, but his ERA was good, 205, and he had 22 saves. He was on loan to Portland during the 83 season. And then the Phillies picked him up. He served as a middleman with Reed and Holland, the short man, a strike, and the count is 0-1. Anderson, like so many of the relief pitchers today, pitching out of a stretch with nobody on base. 1-1 one one on Lowenstein, who's homered and doubled. Two balls and a strike to count. It's uh, Storm Davis just getting in some work in the Baltimore pen. He does not figure to start as Al Cabelli has indicated it will be Flanagan game three and then it will go back to McGregor for the fourth game on Saturday. If you're wondering about Jim Palmer, yep, he's one of the long men. Hit in the air to the left field and curling down the line and it is foul, just foul. Just barely sliced foul. Lowenstein thought he had it. He thought he had it in there. Kiss it goodbye. That's the telltale sign that was used before John hit his first home run, or his only home run of this game. In fact, but look at this. Was fair all the way till the last minute and just hooked foul. And that's one of the reasons you have umpires down the lines in the World Series and playoffs to make those calls, and Dutch Renner was right there. I've seen many a call like that miss during the regular season. Oh, yeah. Well, Brennan's about uh, 40 feet away from it. In the regular season, you're about uh, 180. Big difference. Hit on a hop to Rose, who stays with it, juggles, shovels to Anderson in time to get him. So one away. And it will bring up Dower. We were talking about Palmer in the bullpen. As you look again, a squibber that had a lot of uh, top spin on it, and Pete able to stay with it after he got momentarily handcuffed. Jim Palmer, if you call his house, is a, a, an answering machine that says, Hi, this is Jim Palmer. I'm not home. If you need me in an emergency, you can call the ballpark. And here's the number of the ballpark. And then when you get him, ask for the bullpen. That's extension 75. <laughs> <laughs> That's like Bob Fleming. When he used to be with the pack and then with the Dolphins, the tight end. Had an answering service. I want to look out here. There's, There's Jim. And he used to call Fleming and the service would answer. This is Bob Elrod Hendricks. The one-time pitcher under Earl yes, Weaver. Yes, he was. <laughs> That's outside. Fleming's message was... You can reach me at the Super Bowl. <laughs> at a point in time, he had been in more Super Bowls than any other active player. One ball, two strikes to count. And it's fouled away. Danny Ford will look at Danny, who looks none the worse for wear, and he indicates, as he knows the camera's on him, that everything's okay. That's good to see. He's a remarkable fellow. Nice scene when he trotted out to right field. Fans giving him the ovation he deserved. Well, Dower had a hit last time up. He had a couple good cuts on some pitches on the inside half of the plate early at this turn at bat. But there he started chasing the pitch that's outside out of the strike zone. Again. One ball, two strikes with one out of the bases empty. A soft liner to Dave Jesus. Why do you like Dower so much? Dower gives you everything you got, Hart. He's the manager's type of ball player. He does the hitting behind the runner, the hitting running. Puts his body in front of the bad hop. Sure hands. The play that we saw last night when he dove into the runner to catch a bad throw by Todd Cruz. Manager's type of ball player. And he used to call you what, Earl? <laughs> Took him three years to learn to call me Skip or Earl. You called me coach when he came out of college. <laughs> Grounded to third. And Mike Schmidt throws him out. So that's an easy inning. 
as the Orioles go out one, two, three. Facing Larry Anderson. We'll go to the seventh in game two. Baltimore three and Philadelphia one. Intelligent. Yes, he is smart, but he couldn't do what he does if he weren't. ABC's World News Tonight with Peter Jennings. The difference can be distinguished. Okay. Number one ranked Nebraska taking on Missouri. 3.30 Eastern time. College football will follow game four of the World Series on Saturday. Third baseman. And it begins at 3.30 Eastern time, 12.30 on the coast. Bowie Kuhn, the departing commissioner of baseball. Taking off some weight. Looks very good indeed. He does. Spent a, a good part of the summer with you, didn't he, in the Hamptons? Mm-hmm. Seventh inning as Mike Schmidt leads off by taking a strike on one. Schmidt, Lespay, and then Matthews, Boddicker. A one-hit shutdown through six. One and one. This is a big inning for him. 226, lowest in the major leagues on grass fields this season. Two games in this series, Fields have batted 120. Well, that's all well and good. The game's played between the white lines, and Schmidt is a great hitter. Foul ball. One ball and two strikes on Mike Schmidt. Phillies last night had five hits, three singles, and the two homers by Morgan and Maddox. And tonight, just that infield single by Morgan. Their run unearned. It's three to one Baltimore as they try to square the series. Yet the Phillies are still up one game to nothing with a 120 team batting average. Well, the Phillies have been a resourceful team this season. A team that wins a pennant with a collective batting average of 249. We talked about the adversity they've been through last night, the change of managers. It's not at all the team that they thought they would feel when they left spring training. Foul back. So they have adjusted during the course of the season, and right now three victories away from a world title. And the fellow that's at bat gave him 40 home runs, and that's going to win you quite a few ball games. And 100, right. 109 runs batted in. And he is almost desperate to bust out. I ran into him quite by chance. He was shopping with his wife today. Hits it in the air to right field. Ford will wait for it to come down, which it always does. One away. It'll bring up LaFay. The Phillies were sourceful in the sense the batting average was low, but when you look at runs scored, they were third in the league. Ninth in team batting average, so what it tells you is they normally got the hits when they needed them. Exactly, and they know how to win. There's something about this group of players. Strike to LaFay. There's John Denny, last night's pitcher, and Kiko Garcia also in that shot. Eddie Murray will make it three unassisted in the scorebook. And there are two down. Since the error by Murray, Boddicker has retired each man he has faced, 10 and all. Quite a performance thus far. I know if you're sitting on a bench watching a Boddicker pitch, you want to get up to home plate and just see how the heck he's doing it. But Jim Palmer said he throws harder than a lot of people think is that 90 mile an hour pitch that we had early in the game we testified to. And Jim Palmer also said he throws slower than anybody <laughs> What a know the count on Matthews. That's a strike. You're right, Earl. He looks like the kind of guy Pete Rose used to sit in the clubhouse once in a while and watch a pitcher on television and say, get me a bat. And he's that kind of a pitcher when you see him on TV. Two and one, but I think people have seen him on TV enough last week and this to understand right now that he's doing something right. Well, the amazing thing is you think that uh, they'd start timing him now, become more accustomed to him, but the graphic that they sh we showed earlier shows that he gets better as the innings go on. Three and one. And the graphic you just saw shows how he allows less hits than innings pitch, which is another excellent index to pitching efficiency. 
right field, and that's the first clean hit tonight for the Phillies. Gary Matthews, who had one hit last night, so he has two in the series, and it will bring up Gross. Well, that was one of the very few pitches that Fatiker threw right down the middle. The count was three to one, and with a two-run lead, he did not want to walk anybody. Greg Gross has grounded the second and grounded the short. One and no. would play Gross around to left in a very pronounced fashion. The Orioles pretty close as you can see there to straight away. Straight away. With the center fielder shading just the least bit to left field. Two and one. It's interesting though to watch the alignments because we see one league all the time. Most teams play most hitters about the same and then they get into the series and all of a sudden on the basis of the scouts normally it sometimes changes. The infield is straight away all the way. Gross is a slap hitter, likes to go to left field. He's hit only six homers in his career, and five of those came in one year, 1977, with Sammy Stewart throwing in the bullpen for Baltimore. How much credence did you give to scouting reports at World Series? I studied him, Howard. Well, he goes to the left side on the ground, and it's Cruz going to Dower just in time. So Gross went according to Hoyle, and the Orioles were lucky to throw out Matthews on the fourth. No runs, a hit, and a man left on. As you look at Matthews, the throw getting there along with Dower just in time to get Gary and end the top half of the seventh inning. Dower got a late start there. He thought Cruz was going to throw the ball to first base, and at the last minute, just beat him into the bat. So in the inning, no runs are hitting the man left on. We'll go to the bottom of the seventh inning in Baltimore. The Orioles on top, three to one. Jerry, don't fear. Jogging can be hazardous to your health. We'll tell you why on Eyewitness News tonight at 1045, plus a special report on physical fitness and how some celebrities shape up for demanding acting roles. Get that perfect body this week at 11. Al Michaels, Howard Cosell, Earl Weaver. We start the bottom of the seventh inning with Rick Dempsey taking the strike. Game two, Baltimore on top, three to one as they try to square things. Off day tomorrow, and then game three in Philadelphia Friday night. Dempsey popping it up in foul ground. Rose coming over, but he will run out of room. It's back in the dugout. 0-2. We talked about what Baltimore has done under its mayor, William Donald Schaefer. It's been a remarkable urban renewal process. It's only fair to liken what Philadelphia has been doing in the same vein. I tell you, Nancy strikes out swinging. You go along that Schuylkill River and you see those old restored homes. It gives you a feeling of the roots of this nation. It's a beautiful place and a beautiful feeling. You were always good in the double skull. I'll take you on tomorrow as the hand builds for a Boddicker. Great ovation for Mike. Not only for what he's done tonight, but remember, he shut out the White Sox in game two, a critical game last week in the playoffs. Tying a league championship series record, 14 strikeouts. Want to know the count. And you don't figure a finesse pitcher is going to get 14 strikeouts. Two and on now. Howard, the way you analyze cities, I can't wait till next year when I get you out to my hometown, San Francisco, for the All-Star game. Bring your overcoat. It's July, but you'll need it. Or will you be in the Hamptons that night? Nice? Probably. <laughs> De Jesus takes care of him. I'll be judging the pet show. <laughs> yeah, like you did this year. 
Two down. Well, the Baltimore Orioles pitchers didn't start taking batting practice until the World Series began. Joe Altavelli was afraid that someone might get hit with a pitch in batting practice during the playoffs and not be able to perform. But the way Boddicker swung the bat all night long, it looked like he's a pretty good hitter and been taking batting practice all year. Anderson has retired the five men he's faced as Shelby stands in. Shelby struck out in the fifth inning. Keeps hitting for Bumbrey who started the game in center. Oh, and one to count. This Philadelphia team hangs tough. I'll tell you, Anderson's come in. He's done a job. Hernandez collected himself after the terrible incident when the ball got away for him and struck for it on the batting helmet. But they hang tough. This, one and one. This series is beginning a lot like one we had in 1980 for sustained drama, maybe the best I've ever seen between this Philadelphia team and the Houston Astros. The playoff series. Yep. You were with me then. No, I was doing the other series that year. New York, Kansas City, which the Royals won in three. I was watching you, though. Oh, the bread home run against Cossage. Yeah. Right. Without pine tar. Without pine tar. I was <laughs> going to say that. <laughs> Two balls, two strikes, the count. That pine toy might have been there. Nobody noticed it. <laughs> Into the upper deck. The Oriole mascot. Sitting back and enjoying it now, isn't he? Not so the Philly fanatic. Foul back again. Two and two to count. Three runs, five hits, and one error for Baltimore. One run, two hits, and no errors for the Phil. Two out and the base is empty. Anderson working his last inning here because he's due up third when the Phillies come up in the top of the eighth. Diaz. De Jesus, and in the pitcher's spot. Wrapped foul by Ripken. Two. two balls, two strikes. Last at bat shot, John Shelby was batting right hand and must have fouled off six or seven pitches. Cal Ripken Sr., the third base coach, and of course the father of the Oriole shortstop, and one of the men they very seriously considered as the successor to Earl Weaver. Grounded to the right side, and Morgan goes out on the grass, and off balance doesn't get it. Shelby can fly, and Rose questions the call by Clark. Joe Morgan went a long way for that ball, and his momentum was carrying him out to the right field foul line and couldn't get a lot on that throw. Even more than that, didn't he have a little trouble with it when he got to it? Well, we'll get to see it right here, Howard. He's got it. But, uh, up in the he, heel of the glove. He had it go so far, he had to throw off balance and didn't get quite as much on the throw as he wanted. Very good call by Al Clark, the first base umpire. That is uh, the Philly right. fanatic, <laughs> of course, minus his normal uniform. I guess he had to take it off in Baltimore. Young Raymond, which is, I'm trying to remember his first name, but his father is football coach down at Delaware. Yeah, he turns out great teams, too. We have a run situation here, fellas. Shelby at first base with two down. Here was Danny Ford and what happened the last time. So it's a, a sheer delight under these circumstances just to see him standing in for his next at back. This takes a little guts, too, believe you me. Yes, it does, Howard. Best thing to get right back in there, though. Well, the Phillies are thinking run situation and pitched out. Ron Say did and had a big game. Came back after the trip east. Los Angeles and had a big game against the Yanks. One ball, one strike to count. Right now, Shelby's going to go the first chance he gets. Anytime he feels like he's got a good jump on the pitcher, he's going to take off and try to steal second base. I'm not going to ask you if they've seen signs, Earl, but are the signs different than they were when you were here? Yes, they, they are. Tell? Okay. 
In other words, you want to know if I'm guessing or got some inside information. You better believe it. <laughs> One ball, two strikes. Situation calls for it. If you can get it, try to get it. All right, is he going here? One, Might two. even have another pitch out. I'd be a little afraid of another pitch out right here. All right. One and two. So you would uh, you keep him at first? I'd let him go if he gets a jump. Pitch out, you're right, and they keep him at first, and the count is two and two. I'd, I'd have been thrown out, but I definitely have him running right now. Okay. He'll go now. There's Boddicker looking on. Nicely chiseled features. He doesn't go, and Ford loops it into right field, and that's a base hit. And Shelby will go to third. So runners at first and third as the Orioles seek insurance with two out in the bottom of the seventh. I'll tell you, look at Dan Ford. He, incidentally, his best power is to right center. He's got good power to right field. He stayed right in there, Howard. He didn't give an inch. That's right. The ball wasn't hit real good, but takes a lot of nerve to walk back up there, just like you mentioned before. What, what we have, what we have right here now, is Cal Ripken coming to a plate in a situation where they have to give him a pretty good pitch, or face uh, Eddie Murray again with the bases loaded. Interestingly, in the two games thus far, the Birds have gotten virtually nothing from Ripken and Murray, their big hitters. A single, fighting off an inside pitch, grounded single by Ripken last night, and Murray with that single to left field. And that's all. There's a fake move to third. They throw to first and almost get him, and Rose is mad again at Al Clark. That's a play. You see that a lot. That fake to third, throw to first, you almost never see it work. This is about as close as they'll come. Well, he had Dan going the wrong way. And he executed it, did Anderson perfectly. So just a tad high as Rose comes down on the shoulder and the hand gets in. Grounded to the right side. That's through for a base hit. Shelby scores. Ford is going to third as the ball dies on the grass. And it's four to one. Two straight hits off of two pretty good pitches. Neither ball was hit hard, but they both found holes. One of them in the outfield and one of them in between the first baseman and the second baseman. Rose holding the runner at first base, and that opens up the right side of the infield in this situation, and Ripken putting it through. There's Rose, the pitch on the outside half the plate. Cal tried to go with it, and he got it in the hole. As I said, the ball wasn't hit hard, and that allowed Dan Ford, who we see right rounding second, a chance to go to third. Murray fouls it back. Billy scored first in the fourth, but Baltimore three in the fifth, one here in the seventh, and it's up and away. One ball and one strike on Eddie Murray with Ford, the runner at third. Ripken in first. All is coming with two down. Anderson had retired the five men he had faced. Then singles by Shelby. The infield hit on a close play at first. The looping single by Ford. And the bouncing single to right by Ripken. So they're not keying off on Anderson but they produce two and one secret of a team success is for everybody to pitch in both the players on the Phillies and the Orioles did that all year rounded down to Morgan and Eddie Murray leaves a couple of more so Murray tonight alone has stranded five but the Orioles get one more and after seven lead it four to one in Baltimore Sunday. Oh, I'd like to see you. Mark puts the moves on a deadly dame. You rang, sir. Who's too hot to handle. Hold me. Hardcastle and McCormick, Sunday at 8. That's quite a sight from the Goodyear blimp cruising above Memorial Stadium in Baltimore. He worried me. He seemed awfully low. The zoom lens, though, that's what it is. <laughs> it's that shot. They're the available pinch hitters for the Phillies, so if you're Owens, you're looking at all right-handed batters. The lefty on the bench tonight was Von Hayes, and he's already been used. He struck out in the sixth inning. Bo Diaz will lead off in the eighth inning and takes a pitch that just misses inside, ball one. 
Joel yeah. Altabelli sitting in the Baltimore bench knows that all those pinch hitters are right-handed. And it'd be interesting to see if he goes with Tippy Martinez, uh, the fellow that did the short work for him all year, who's left-handed. Not earlier, last inning he had Stewart up. And there it is again. Good old neighborhood ballpark here in Baltimore. Hilton 54. Remember the time in the football game? Blaine came in here into the seats. Fortunately, after the game. Tragically. A private plane landed in the upper deck about, I guess, what, six or seven years ago after an NFL playoff game. Two and one to count. And to count two and two. Here's Steve Carlton. Steve Cole. Talking to Tony Perez. Mr. Wonderful. Come on, Bo. <laughs> and Dempsey, that's the last thing an umpire wants to have happen. Uh, that's Rick doesn't the believe it. Away and pitch looked pretty good, didn't it, Earl? It looked like a good pitch, but I'll tell you, Vargo is mad. He's a yep. senior umpire in the National League, and I think he'll be saying something to Dempsey him right now or yeah. on the next pitch. That is a pretty good pitch, though. He obviously thought it was a touch low, but that pitch looked very good. And a 3-2 delivery. Fisted foul off to the right. Eighth inning. Baltimore on top, 4-1 to as they try to square the series. Had Eddie Murray come through any one of his opportunities, this would have been a laugher. Yes, it would have. Right. That's a looper to the right side and in for a base hit. So keep it in mind, they don't get the call on the 2-2 pitch. And the next thing you know, instead of going back to the bench, he's at first base. And the next thing you know, this Philadelphia team is, as you said, resourceful. They find ways to win. Meanwhile, they will go to the bench here. Juan Samuel, who spent most of the season at Portland, and the Phillies regard him as their second baseman of the future. Really a young player. Comes in to pinch run for Diaz, and that means we'll see Ozzy Virgil go back to the plate in the bottom of the inning. So Samuel, the heir apparent to Joe Morgan, runs for Diaz with De Jesus at the plate. Two of the three hits that the Phillies have at this time came when the count was 3-1 and 3-2, and Mike Bader Bodiker had to go down the middle with a fastball. the number eight hitter. So you have the pitcher spot next. As De Jesus grounds it to the hole. Backhanded by Ripken. He goes to Dower one. Turns it over not in time. He gets the lead runner though as he erases some well. And with one out they'll go to the bench and it will be Tony Perez to pinch it. It was a nice play by Ripken. We'll see it right here. He timed that ball. When he first started playing shortstop he tried to get in front of this ball. He took it on the right hop. Poised himself. Gave a good throw to Dower, and now there's one out and a man on first base. A look at Ripken. Well, he started last season, of course, at third, and then Earl moved him over to short. And here is Tony Perez. A great gentleman, a man who they thought might retire, and a man who didn't figure to wind up in the National League because he'd been the DH at Boston and then it looked like he was gone. And Rose, among others, uh, convinced Paul Owens and Bill Giles that he'd be a good acquisition for him, and he paid off for them this season. He certainly did. Great type of player to have on a ball club. Tony inspires other people and uh, says the right things at the right time. He's the type of person who can go around and put his arm around you and pick you up when you're in a slump. Want to know the count? Intangibles. Well, you talked about the chemistry the Reds had in those years. He was part of the machine, of course, with Rose and Morgan and, and Tony Perez and people like that under Sparky Anderson. And you can see part of the reason that team had the success it did. Having a big affair, by the way, October 22nd for Johnny Bench, Bob Hope, among many others involved, and former President Ford. Perez is a high chopper to Dower. He goes to Ripken and back to Murray, and it's a double play. So the leadoff single after the disputed call on the pitch, but it does no damage. Chopper, and they make it look very easy. Dower over to Ripken, 
and DeMurray. And so at the end of seven and a half, it remains in game number two, the Baltimore Orioles four and the Philadelphia Phillies one. Excited. Wild Bill Hagee. He's been doing that since, I guess, 1979 or always when he began that. The yes, body language and the spelling out of the letters Orioles. New battery. Ron Reed is the pitcher. Ozzie Virgil is the catcher. Ron Reed at the age of 40. And there's Virgil, whose dad, of course, Ozzie Sr., Former infielder with several teams and currently the third base coach with the San Diego Padres. Bottom of the eighth inning. John Lowenstein to lead things off. It's four to one Baltimore. And Reed starts him with a strike. Going on. Hit to the left side and through for a base hit. Lowenstein with three quarters of the cycle. A double, a home run, and now a single here in the eighth inning. That's hit number nine for the Orioles. Lowenstein swinging a bat with a lot of confidence. Went right with the pitch again. Pitch on the outside half of the plate. He drove him in the left field. By the way, I hear your ex-second baseman, Davey Johnson, may be the manager of the Mets. That's what it's reported, Howard, and I think they're supposed to announce it tomorrow. There is... The big hero in the clinching game Saturday, Tito Landrum, who had been in the minors in the Cardinal team much of the season. He comes in to pinch run. He hit the home run at Comiskey into the upper deck on Saturday. That turned out to be the winning run in the 10 inning 3 0 victory. Landrum running for Lowenstein. Dower 1 for 3 at the plate. Running foul. 0 and 1. You don't need to give me that look, Howard. I would be bunting in this situation. You be, I'd be yeah. going after that fifth yeah. run, yes. Keeps the grand slam from, from beating you. Reggie Jackson shaking his head no. Well, if Reggie Jackson was the hitter, I wouldn't be. But Rich Howard was the a pitch that was inside and again it's fouled away 0-2 so Reed coming right in on his hands and Landrum will go back to first base trying to push it actually trying to get out of the way sacrifice, of that sacrifice all but eliminate it with two strikes so we might see a hit and run play here John Lowenstein and remember he's the man that has turned in the defensive gym of the series last night To the count. Right now, Mr. Lowenstein, you start to think about a series MVP, and the fellow has a car for winning it. The Steiner has a, a couple of hubcaps already. Yes, he does, but it's mighty early. It is. Yeah, it's much Very too early. early to get into that. He's still bunting with two strikes, and that's strike three. So Dower can't lay one down. Well, I was I was all but wrong about the sacrifice being eliminated. Fourth inning, Morgan single, stole second. Murray made an error. LaFay hit a sack fly to make it one to nothing. But then the fifth inning, Lowenstein started it with a homer. The big blow was Dempsey's two-run double, and or one-run double that sent a man to third cruise, and then Boddicker hit the sacrifice fly to score him. Then with two out in the seventh inning, Shelby, Ford, and Ripken with successive singles, four to one. Cruz the batter. One for three, a bunch single. Good chance uh, Landrum might be running right now. The strike, he's not taking much of a lead. Was the fellow they picked up 
when they sent Floyd Rayford from Rochester to St. Louis at a time when the Cardinals wanted a right-handed batting infielder. Very short lead for Landry. Token throw over to first. It is a short lead if he has thoughts of stealing the base. And he goes. Gets a pretty good job. It's swung on a miss and the throw sails away from De Jesus. So he didn't stretch it out very much, but Landrum was able to get a very good jump on Reed, who, of course, uh, at six feet six, takes a little bit of time to deliver to the plate. Yes, he does, and a lot of runners would like, some of them like to shorten up their lead and try to get that extra two steps, uh, try to get the pitcher to forget about him. No balls, two strikes to count. One away, Landrum at second. Two away. So we'll see Dempsey and looking ahead now to the top of the ninth inning when the Phillies come up. We'll see the top of the order Morgan, Rose, and then Smith. Dempsey with a double. Interesting. We talked about the six, seven, eight, and nine spots. They were the men. Primarily responsible for the rally in the fifth inning. And they will walk Dempsey intentionally here. First base is open, and they figure they might as well go to work on Boddicker. So runners will be at first and second. Outside of that one little flurry, though, in the fifth inning, the bottom of the lineup for Baltimore has done nothing at all. But that one little flurry was enough to make the difference so far tonight. for the in his 17th title defense takes on Gusty Jose Caba, the WBA World Featherweight Championship when ABC's Wide World of Sports returns October 22nd. Tito Landrum staying in the game, playing left field as we go to the ninth inning in Baltimore. Al Michaels, Howard Cosell, and Earl Weaver at Memorial Stadium, and uh, we'll take the day off tomorrow. And on to Philadelphia Friday. Talk to you at 8 o'clock Eastern Time, 5 o'clock on the West Coast for Game 3, Flanagan against Carlton. So it's Morgan, Rose, and Schmidt facing Boddicker, who has faced three men over the minimum. He has allowed three hits. He hasn't walked a man. And he has struck out five. As the Orioles try to square the series at a game apiece. A strike. You know, there's a little Walter Mitty in all of us. What goes through this fellow's mind right now? Kid at a rural Iowa, starts the season in the minors. Morgan hits a fly ball to center, and now that kid from rural Iowa, and Sheldon makes the catch, is two outs away from winning the second game of the World Series after pitching a shutout in the playoff. What goes through his mind right now? I gotta get these guys out. I gotta get these guys out. I gotta get these guys out. That's all that's on his mind right now. That's what he should be thinking too, Howard. And he told me yesterday that he wasn't going to get nervous, or at least he hadn't up to that point. And certainly his look tonight like he wasn't nervous. This is a team you can't make a pitching mistake against, he said. He's absolutely right. Pete Rose takes a strike. 
But it's a night you know that down the line he'll sit back and, and savor with relish. Chopper. Monitor. Over to Murray. So two down. And were it not for Ripken juggling the grounder by Morgan, Boddicker would be on the verge of a second straight postseason shutout. Here's Smith. There's no question this is a remarkable young pitcher. It's been 1919. That was the last year a pitcher threw a rookie pitcher threw a three hitter in a World Series game. And he's one out away from accomplishing that right now with Mike Smith at the plate. And Smith's going to lay one down. He does that from time to time. It's a smart move. A home run means nothing. You need a base runner. Well, here. that's exactly right, Al. The home fans are booing, but it's a team player that'll do that. Try to get on for the next fella until you get that tie and run up at home plate and then swing away. And with Cruz playing so deep at third, Smith figures, why not? If I can just put it on the ground, I'm there. You can see he's come in a couple of steps now. He was almost back on the outfield grass. No balls in the strike. Two out, no one on. Foul ball. Oh, and two. The final Philippe for Pat Santarone. Yes, yeah, that's the right. Groundskeeper. He made this field not only playable, but we didn't see the slipping and sliding that we thought we might. The crowd rising is one. They want Parker to end it with a flourish. With a strikeout if he can. And he does. Pitched an outstanding game and wound it up throwing that fastball exactly where he wanted. Up and out of the strike zone. What a performance. He starts the season in Rochester in the International League and plays in front of crowds of three and four and five thousand. And six months later, he's in Baltimore. And so... Exactly the kind of series we expected and predicted is coming to pass. Look at that for a reaction shot. What, what relief. This is going to be a tough, tight, and probably seven-game series. We'll be right back.